Well, hello, this is Dean Tenney. I'm coming to you from my studio here in fabulous Las Vegas, and we're working our way through an explication of the NASA test specifications. Uh, we're doing it, we're chunking it out, so this will probably be pretty short because capital market theory, C, is two or three questions. So uh, make sure you print out this document so you can follow along in terms of the explication. Of those two or three questions, we know that this answer set is going to be one of them, if not even two. I get feedback sometimes that the, the efficient market hypothesis is more than one question. So again, sometimes the best way to proceed on these explications is by just putting in the answer set and making sure we're prepared for that answer set. And the answer set here will be weak form of um, Efficient mark hypothesis B would be semi strong, and uh, C will be strong form. So we know that's going to be one of the two or three. So let's uh, put that there, remind ourselves we need to do that. Uh, capital asset pricing model. Again, I think a lot of people, a lot of candidates, test takers get hung up on how much quantitative questions are going to be there. There is not going to be a lot of quantitative. Oh, it looks like, let me kill this. There we go. Um, there's not gonna be a lot of, uh, as much quantitative <laughs> analysis as people fear, right? So if whatever you're fearful of on the exam, you're gonna swear you had like 200 of them, but that's not really the, the case. Anyways, what we're using a capital asset pricing theory to do is to determine the required rate of return that we need. I'll say required or expected rate of return. Uh, from, from an investment. You know, the idea here is we have to be compensated for both uh, the risk and the time, you know, so we're going to plug in this part of that's one of the underpinnings of modern portfolio here, by the way, is we're going to assume some kind of risk free rate of return. You know, be careful, a lot of uh, test takers mess this up and they they get baited into saying the risk free rate of return is a particular interest rate. It's not, it's whatever we choose uh, to use to do the math. You know, basically the risk-free rate of return is what you get paid to not play any of these games that we're discussing, right? Not to invest, uh, basically. And so we're also going to take that into consideration. And what we're saying here is that we have to be compensated for systematic risk. You know, we've talked in other things about analytical tools like beta. And we said one of the underpinnings of this thing is to be properly diversified. You know, if we have a portfolio that's uh, properly diversified, the only risk that we should still be exposed to in an ideal world <laughs> would be uh, systematic risk. Uh, we're not going to make you do any math here. We're not going to make you do any uh, math on the capital asset pricing uh, model. It's just, again, one of the underpinnings of modern portfolio theory. And uh, modern portfolio theory we're doing modern portfolio theory, what we're trying to do is come up with a portfolio where we uh, maximize return. So let's put that in here. Let me get rid of it. Where we uh, maximize returns. Maximize, how do you spell maximize? Good news, it's not a spelling test. Max, maximize, maximize returns while minimizing risk. I joke, you know, the guys who practice this, Nirvana, if we can find that uh, place uh, where we can maximize returns while minimizing uh, risk. And, you know, wh whatever the acceptable risk is to the, to us. And 
the place where we can maximize risk. Maximize return while minimizing risk, maximize returns with an acceptable rate of risk. Because, you know, uh, we talked about beta earlier in the explication. So, you know, I might accept a, uh, a certain amount of volatility or risk, and that's a choice. It's a conscious choice about how much risk I'm going to have in the portfolio in terms of beta, right? One and a half, two, three, four, whatever the case. And then in other parts of our explications, uh, we have talked about the idea of negative correlation and how that adds additional diversification to the uh, portfolio. Uh, so, you know, this is not, you know, what we're doing here, right? But modern portfolio theory says that we can get different asset classes and securities and, uh, you know, what we're looking for here is like negative correlation. You know, what you might want to do on, on things like this, where there's two or three questions, maybe I get uh, some flashcards uh, handy and that might not uh, be a bad idea. All right, so then we said of the two or three questions, one of them is certainly going to be efficient market hypothesis. Uh, let me get a different color for this. Uh, you know, again, two or three questions here on capital market theory. Um, please make sure you uh, realize I just told you it's very high probability that you're going to get at least one, if not two. If it's two, you know, questions and that's it. You're done with this section. If it's three, one remainder. But anyways, weak form, I'm going to get, uh, remember, it says technical uh, analysis doesn't work because everybody has the same set there. And, you know, this does make room for perhaps uh, doing fundamental analysis. Maybe we'll be able to find, uh, you know, with fundamental analysis, some uh, thing on the balance sheet where we can make a different interpretation, interpretation on the balance sheet income statement or statement of cash flow. So it makes room for perhaps fundamental analysis working. Where a semi-strong form of efficient market hypothesis, efficient market means, by the way, there's no sense in trying to beat the market. You know, it's just a waste of time and resources. A semi-strong means neither, let me get my blue again, neither technical or fundamental analysis will work. Uh, this version does make, uh, make room for inside information, non-public. And then the strong form says uh, nothing works. So again, I would expect this as an answer set. If not seeing this answer set twice, I've had many test takers tell me they've seen this answer set twice with different uh, expectations of the answer each time. Anyway, strong would be uh, nothing works. You know, one of the uh, evangelicals of uh, passive investing and modern portfolio theory, uh, wrote a, a very famous book called Random Walk down Wall Street. His name is uh, Mikhail, M-A-L-K-I-E-L. -E I think I'm pretty proud of that, right? And he really uh, popularized this idea of passive management, you know, in terms of uh, the basis of uh, modern portfolio theory. And so random walk is right up there with strong. You're not gonna get a question on random walk. The reason I bring it up is because the idea here is we're not gonna give up. We're still gonna we'll recommend uh, something passive like a S&P index fund. So that's the other test question would be come up with a recommendation uh, based on uh, somebody who gives you a strong form. So I'm talking, I'm an investment advisor representative. 
you're a potential client, and you tell me you believe in the strong form of the efficient market hypothesis. Remember, theories aren't truth, just a way of explaining things. Hypothesis is not a, a truth either. It's just a way that uh, we can look at the world and maybe, maybe it's right, maybe it's not, but it's informative. It's just a tool is the point. But if uh, the a client tells me that that's what he wants to do, uh, you know, as he says, I'm willing to accept a market-based return. I believe in the strong form. I want to minimize my trading costs. Uh, what might I recommend? And that would be an index fund. So there's at least one question on the exam where the index fund ends up being uh, the, the right answer. All right, well, this will probably be the shortest ever you know, uh, uh, thing we put on the channel. And I told you, I'm going to try and chunk it up to make it easy for people to find and easy to digest. So uh, rather than uh, setting the you know, thing and going for an hour or so, what I'll do is we go through these sections of the explication, I'll just do uh, one each time. And again, this is the exact same uh, test questions for 65 and 66. I'm going to put it in the separate playlist because I don't want you to have to go back and forth. And uh, I know it can be exasperating uh, when you, you know, everybody's trying to make something work for you. But anyways, the only difference in this content on the 65 or 66 is on 65, this is two questions. And on 66, this is three questions. So that's the only difference in terms of the uh, discussion I just had with you. So I'll be putting this in both of those documents and you can see what's coming next. And hopefully you printed the PDF. What's coming next is uh, the five questions. Or if it's 65, I haven't checked, it'll probably be six or seven questions, but that's kind of what's going on. Okay, well, like, share, subscribe. We're coming up on a one year anniversary of the YouTube channel. Uh, pretty excited. We've got over 200,000 views. We're closing on 3,000 subscribers. So listen, if you're a 66, this is probably the last leg of your testing journey, but don't leave any test takers behind. Uh, please let other test takers know about our channel for if they're SIE, if they're just starting out, or if they're on this, uh, that first leg, let them know about the Series 7, if they're on the second leg of their testing journey. And uh, kudos to you if this is your third and final leg of your testing journey. I'm assuming if you're taking a 65, you're either a fee-based investment advisor uh, firm and your you know, investment advisor rep, and this is going to be the end of it. Or if you're taking a 65, you're a series 663 or 763, and now you're going to represent or want to represent the broker dealers affiliated investment advisory firm. In either case, uh, bon chance, mon ami, uh, like, share, and subscribe, and I'll see you for the next installment soon. Uh, if you have any questions, just comment. I'm pretty good at responding to questions and comments. <laughs>